is um, hackers are figuring out really interesting ways to bleed revenue out of companies that um, are associated with their API traffic. Um, that could be things like um, referral fraud, um, sign up for a new account uh, and get $25. Refer a friend and get $25 more. dollars. Um, and what we see are waves of fraudulently created um, uh, new accounts. And those new accounts then are referring five or six additional friends and family who are also fraudulent accounts. Um, and they're all riding on API front ends as well as API back end processing. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with uh, Richard Bird. Richard is CSO of Traceable, which is the leading API security and observability company. We had a previous interview on the topic of uh, uh, FDIC insured financial institutions and how they align uh, latest API security components in their mandates. But today, our uh, major topic will be on PCI compliance update and on uh, recent uh, findings of uh, survey provided by uh, Richard's company. So we will discuss it uh, in the details. But before that, could you please, Richard, remind uh, who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, so I'm Richard Bird. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Traceable. Um, my fascination, fascination and interest in, in banking and financial services and fintech comes by um, experience. Uh, I spent 20 plus years in the corporate world. Um, I was in banking and financial service for about services for about 17 or 18 of that. Um, and uh, I've been a CIO uh, in my first career track in technology and uh, then became uh, a uh, information security practitioner and a CISO. Uh, and, uh, and, and I realized the other day that I'm celebrating my 30th year in technology this year. Um, so I definitely have been around for a while, um, but I moved into the solution side about five or six years ago. And a lot of my effort and time is spent um, digging into the mechanics and the motion of markets around security solutions to understand why companies or organizations are moving quickly to resolve or remediate these particular types of risks and threats while they may not be moving very fast to move mitigate others and what are the driving forces and factors behind that and uh and and it's been great i've been with traceable for uh right at two years now and in my working career i've never really seen anything like the landscape of api security and, and risk and threat um it is uh what i like to say one of the largest cognitive dissonance gaps i've ever seen I can walk into a room of a, a thousand people and ask how many people are concerned about the risk and threat of APIs to your organization, to your revenue, to your reputation, and almost every hand will go up in the room. And then when I ask how many of you have an API security program uh, in place beyond just a uh, web application firewall and a gateway, and almost every hand goes down. Um, so we have an acknowledged threat and attack surface um, that is growing by the minute, um, but certainly daily. And we have a large number of com companies and organizations that still are not moving uh, to mitigate the risk and threat of this uh, massively and exponentially increasing uh, risk to their organizations. All right, fantastic. Uh, I know that uh, Traceable AI just uh, released uh, uh, its comprehensive research uh, report on the challenges, risks, and strategies in securing APIs across the financial sector. Uh, and uh, maybe you can uh, first um, kind of uh, stop about uh, uh, some uh, ma major fi findings uh, you you uh, you would like to uh, discuss in this interview. Absolutely. Um, well, when we look at the major findings, they're very interesting in that um, they they bolster and support um, what I just said about a lack of aggressive movement towards resolving and mitigating these threats and risks. Um, in the banking industries in particular, so let me be more precise, in organizations that are regulated by the OCC, FFIC, uh, even the FTC, if they are acting and behaving like a, a bank or financial services transactor, um, the threat is clearly understood because the regulators have actually been more prescriptive uh, than in any other time in security history, um, demanding complete and full API inventories, 
uh, complete visibility, not just to the APIs that you collect on the edge, but all APIs, as well as risk assessments. And, and so as we've seen these prescriptive mandates come down, um, we started to ask the questions in the banking and financial services industries, like how much of a concern are these prescriptive uh, requirements for you? And um, in the survey reply, 82% of the respondents said they were very concerned about being able to meet these compliance requirements with their current security stack. And that's interesting <laughs> because um, that's a super majority of banks who have been operating one of the most mature and evolved API markets. Um, and that super majority is still concerned about being able to make uh, meet these these obligations. Um, I think the other thing that was really surprising to me was 64% um, of uh, banks and financial services organizations that responded uh, say they do not, they, it's not that they don't have uh, the information about the context of uh, API activity and user activity associated with the APIs. It's that they have no way to uh, understand that. They do not have the ability um, in within their four walls to be able to divine or discover the information about these APIs, what they're doing, what they're supposed to be doing, who's supposed to be using them and who's not. Um, and that's that's concerning, obviously, um, particularly since banks and financial services institutions have had more than two years um, to work on this problem. And still more than half of these organizations are saying, we do not have the tools, the capability or the processes in place to be able to even understand what our API exposure is. Um, so these are big numbers and, and they should be troubling because the reality is, is that um, API compromises in the banking and financial services space represent a direct and immediate threat to our national financial critical infrastructure. And um, when we start thinking about the potential damage, uh, you know, nationally to our economy because of, um, you know, very widely exposed uh, attack surfaces amongst these banks, um, it's something that we really should be paying attention to and, and making progress on immediately. Mm -hmm. And what are the major risks? Is it more related to preventing unauthorized access or uh, brand reputation, data loss? What What are the major risks uh, discovered? That, that is a great question uh, because it's uh, it, we ask within the survey for our respondents' understandings of what they think is at risk. And what's really interesting is, is there is a tremendous amount of concern for reputational damage. Um, and I think that the reason that the, the percentages are so high as it relates to concerns for reputational damage um, are not because of the typical things about, you know, impacting stock valuation. They're more associated with the size and scales, uh, scale of these uh, breaches that we see. Uh, when we see large mobile care carriers losing 37, 38, 40 million, um, you know, records uh, for their customers, that's a massive number. Um, you know, down in Australia, the Optus and Metabank breaches um, exposed uh, millions of Australian citizens' uh, personal health information. Um, and, and so the size and the scale of these things are probably more associated with the reputational impact than say, I'm worried about my stock price dropping. Um, the other thing is, is financial loss. Um, and as, as that kind of mechanic happens, we see companies that are exposed to substantial financial losses um, that they can't see because um, up until uh, the ability to look at the API itself, uh, this was unsolvable fraud. Um, so we see the banks getting much more savvy about the reputational risk, much more savvy about the financial risk, um, and I think one of the things that was one of the bigger surprises for me on the consequences, what was that risk, um, was 35% of respondents to the survey reported losing customers as a direct result of an API-related breach. That is, that is definitely a needle-moving metric. Um, customer loss, uh, this is one of the first times that I've ever seen a, an attack type that could be associated so tightly to customer sentiment and customer action. And, uh, and our survey respondents are saying that when they suffer an API breach, they lose one out of every three customers um, that are, are associated with that breach. That's, a, that's really compelling. Um, and I think it's, it, again, it's just reflective of the reality of the speed of business 
um, that is able to be um, you know, accelerated and transacted in the API layer. This stuff happens instantaneously, um, whether it be the, the, the breaches and the exploits and the data exfiltration or the economic consequences of your information being hijacked um, in the API space. So it's really um, some really some compelling numbers from, like I said, a, an industry or vertical that has the most experience to date in actually securing their API attack surface. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. So where where uh, we can can we find this report is on your site on your website. Uh, uh... It is. Um, I, we have a full access to the report on traceable.ai. Um, and we pride ourselves uh, on having the uh, the largest amount of publicly available information, um, as in you don't need to do a tremendous amount of work uh, to be able to get a piece of material from us. Um, and uh, so I definitely encourage folks to, to reach out and take a look uh, at the actual report itself. Um, but it, it'd be remiss because you brought it up, uh, up at the top of the, uh, the conversation. Um, I think it's also important that um, we do make references to PCI um, mm -hmm. in uh, this report as well. I'm always really cautious. So this is where I lean back and say, I'm the old, you know, the old banker in tech. Um, I spent a number of years doing that. And I'm always conscious of the fact that um, in today's market, a lot of times people cast PCI around and say, oh, well, you need to worry about this because of PCI compliance without really recognizing that just because an organization is a bank doesn't mean that they're PCI compliant are required to meet PCI compliance requirements. Um, because in many cases, large organizations have outsourced that function uh, to any number of financial services organizations uh, that are available to do that work for them today. So in that case, if I'm a big bank, I may not be PCI mandated. Um, but if I'm a payment processor, I'm almost always going to be PCI mandated. So we wanted to make sure that we made the differentiation here. But I think it's really important to call out because um, mandatory um, uh, guidance from PCI DSS, basically not a regulation, but a standard from the Payments Council that says you have to meet these requirements or you can't transact credit cards, um, which is a really bad outcome for anybody that, that goes down that path. Um, what we're seeing is, again, a very prescriptive change in the PCI DSS requirements from 3.21, which is the current state, to 4.0. And in 4.0, as it's associated with all of the API stuff that we're talking about today, um, the requirement changes from providing uh, PCI a sample of your um, uh, API transactional data to proving that you are continuously monitoring and securing that API uh, traffic. That is a very large leap for, for companies today. That is a big change to go from a statistical distribution mm -hmm. sampling approach to you need to know at all times what your APIs are doing. Um, and so we're seeing a tremendous amount of energy as companies are looking to close that gap uh, before the March 2025 enforcement date. Mm -hmm. And is there some uh, major cost involved and uh, with this uh, uh, kind of com compliance and how can smaller businesses uh, manage the potential cost of this uh, um, resource allocation? Yeah, it, always a tough question, right? I'm, you know, one, I already said that I was conscious of the fact that PCI doesn't apply to all banks. I'm equally conscious that um, I had the very good fortune of work, working in the banking industry and a dozen of those years were for J.P. Morgan Chase, where um, on, on a relative scale, um, money was not an object <laughs> when mm -hmm. it came to you know fixing and solving problems. Um, massive budgets. Matter of fact, you, as an executive at Chase, you become desensitized to the value of money because you're dealing with such enormous budgets. Recognizing that not all organizations are like that. In fact, only a small percentage of companies have those kind of resources at their disposal. Um, I think the reality is, is that many organizations are going to need to rely on qualified service providers uh, to be able to provide um, this level of compliance, certainly not in the big banks um, or in the, uh, in the organizations that say the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau or the F uh, Federal Trade Commission have determined are too large to fail. Um, those organizations will need to find their uh, funding um, and solve those problems. But definitely in the next tier 
of banks, we're going to see a lot of folks struggling to try and figure out how to manage the cost and consequences of these changes. And I would say, if I was going to give the audience a recommendation, um, I would say that um, what I'm seeing in our customer base um, is a recognition that um, we may still be applying old data center security architectures organizationally um, to our cloud problems. And we may not have fully shifted away from um, more data center like security solutions and protocols and into more cloud born type security protocols. And if we start to rethink that security architecture um, as being more in layer seven, more in the web, more in, in API traffic, um, it's actually relatively easy to find resources that you've been expending um, on technology solutions that aren't necessarily as critical anymore, um, or the issues have been solved uh, in other parts of the overall security stack. Um, so we're seeing a lot of budgetary repurposing from organizations that um, have very limited uh, capacity from a resource and a budget standpoint, um, as they start to make decisions on um, acquiring solutions to meet these regulatory demands, um, and start looking away from this is how we used to do it. Um, so we're definitely seeing that motion as well. Awesome. So looking uh, towards the future, what trends or developments uh, do you anticipate in terms of uh, API regulations and their impact on, uh, on the kind of uh, daily life of uh, our audience? And how should companies yeah. uh, prepare to adapt to these challenges? Well, I think... Um... I think without a doubt, either what we've seen so far in the regulations or uh, what conversations I've been a part of as regulations are being reformed or um, formed and and uh, refined um, in in Washington, DC, um, is that uh, these mandates are going to become more prescriptive. Um, we're going to see it used to be regulations would come out and they would say, here's the control obligation you have. We don't care how you achieve it. If you can provide the evidence, we're happy with that, right? This change that we've already seen with APIs and that is going to continue to um, manifest is we do care, care how you collect this information. We do care how you assess this information. Um, you have to show us both the methods as well as the evidence. And you know, in the case of the API inventory demands for FFIC, um, dumping all of that API information into an Excel spreadsheet has been deemed as not satisfactory by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, right? So I think that, you know, future casting, we're going to see much more specific demands, but I think that there's a piece to this that um, supports that. If we look at specifically um, the Federal Reserve and their release of the, the Fed now payment structure, um, the F Fed is saying that they intend to release this real-time payments capability um, out to the public, out to public citizens. Um, and uh, the challenge is, is that the spec associated with um, real-time payments is a published spec. And the bad guys read published specs too. Um, and uh, matter of fact, they, they research them heavily. And it raises the question about if the way that an API is constructed is public knowledge, then how do you secure it and how do you keep it safe? And I think that the regulators are going to address that. And it just really comes down to if the Fed is moving to a space where they're going to transact all payment activity across the Internet, if SWIFT, uh, the, the international clearing organization, is taking itself out with ISO 222 and putting all payment traffic on the Internet, um, it raises this reality that um, the governments that are involved in the management of and oversight of these financial trans transactions are going to put very strict demands on the web layer, on layer seven. Um, because if they don't, the reality is, is we are going to see a catastrophic con consequence for a national uh, financial infrastructure. If not the U.S.'s, then certainly any other number of the nations in the G20 um, because the uh, because the internet is the great democratization layer for hackers, they don't mm -hmm. need you know all kinds of subject knowledge matter expert. They don't need to be subject matter experts on specific technologies, specific coding languages, specific stacks. 
Um, in the internet, none of that exists. Um, all they have to worry about is being able to hack the, the business functionality of whatever is transacting across the internet. And that's why I think that the feds are going to get much more involved. Like if there's any recommendation that I can give again to the listeners on what you should be doing to prepare for this, um, just remember that there are times in our history, technology history, where the answer used to be, I don't know, how many firewall rules do I have? How many virtual machines do I have? Uh, how many web applications are my uh, employees using? Um, those answers used to be, I don't know, just like it is for APIs today. Um, I don't know for APIs will not last. So if the recommendation out there is is useful, I would say go find out what APIs you have as fast as you can um, and start start actually understanding your landscape um, before it becomes non-negotiable and your auditors are demanding it, your external auditors are demanding it, your regulators in your particular in industry are demanding it because it is coming and in banking financial services, it's already here. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Richard, that were fantastic. And that were all my questions. Perhaps if I forgot to ask you something that you see important to our audience, uh, please go ahead. No, I don't think you I don't think you forgot to ask me anything at all. I think um, I, I always enjoy getting an opportunity to hang out and talk with you. Um, I, I would just, you know, the, the, the leaving off note that I would give everybody is um, I say this frequently. If you ever talk to anybody in in security and their response about a particular exploit or an attack is that's interesting, particularly if it's a CISO. What they're really saying is I'm terrified. I've seen something I've never seen before, because in the main, 95 percent of breaches and hacks that we see today um, are still things like escalated credentials, forged tokens and, and, and encryption. Um, they're, they're all, you know, so common that when we see something new, it's a bit shocking um, in APIs and API exploits and attacks. I see something new every week. I see something interesting every week after 30 years in technology. And I don't think that that's a lagging indicator. I think that's a leading indicator of, of catastrophic circumstances and consequences to come if people don't aggressively go after security in layer seven. APIs are a part of that. They're a very large part of that. But I'm also you know, conscious of the fact that APIs aren't all of layer seven traffic. Um, but it, it, it's past time to get intellectually curious about what your risk exposure is in your organizations relative to uh, your API population. Um, and that would be the encouragement, whether you're in banking, whether you're in manufacturing, whether you're in you know, airline travel, um, I can't encourage everyone enough to go find out that information as quickly as they possibly can. All right, fantastic, Richard. Uh, thank you for, for having your time uh, today. And uh, I hope we'll uh, contact with you and speak to you again within a few months about a new update or something uh, really exciting in your, in your uh, current uh, involvement in your business. You bet. Thank you, Boris. I really appreciate your time as well. Bye-bye.